Remember that cricket is a funny game. A hundred years before we protected our head, players looked after their groins. So don't be as stupid as old cricketers. Protect your computer now. NordVPN is the protection I use when facing cyber shortfalls or when rights issues try to dismiss me. Geoblock so you can watch all the cricket you want. Grab your NordVPN deal by going to nordvpn.com forward slash Kimber. Hello and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to episode 53 of the Footmarks podcast. I'm your host, Peram Kazi, who you can find at Def Magno on Twitter. And with me, as always, is Jared Kimber, who you can find literally everywhere. And today's episode of Footmarks is titled Indian Premier Batter, because we'll be breaking down Suresh Raina's IPL career. Uh, taking an extensive look at his numbers in the league in addition to his career arc in an Indian shirt as well, briefly. Now, with all the unprecedented run scoring that we've witnessed in the IPL this season, Jared, I find it absolutely bizarre that no batter has ever been able to score 87 runs in their first 25 balls off in innings since Suresh Raina did it all the way back in 2014 in a playoff match versus Punjab. That's a decade ago. <laughs> mm. Talk about an outlier, right? Yeah, it's um, and he's also, you know, it's not like it's Chris Gale or De Villiers, mm. right? Or even yeah. Yusuf Patan. Um, so it, it's such a random thing. And it tells you how flexible and incredible Suresh Reina was as a player. And when it was working for him, it was working for him about as well as it worked for anyone, right? Mm. Yeah, and I mean, I just wanted to ask you, like, is that Raina Nock in particular the inspiration behind you deciding to write a piece on him? No, I think we we did the um, MVP seasons hmm. uh, video last year, I think, wasn't it? Yes. And I had always been a big fan. I, one of the shots I'm most obsessed with, and I still haven't made a video on this, but I'm sure I will at one point, is the Lofted cover drive. Hmm. And he's kind of the person that makes it popular, right? He's not the person who invents it, obviously. Um, Java, me and dad was there from the start. And you know, people like Damian Martin and, and, you know, a few other players coming through that played it. But Suresh Rain is the one who sort of works out it like a hack of, of mm -hmm. how to do it and then how to hit sixes from it regularly. And then also there's a lot of, like Rohit Sharma is way more famous in the IPL than Suresh Raina, right? Yeah. And yet... In a heartbeat, you would pick Raider over Rohit as a batter. Like, mm -hmm. I know captaincy is a big difference and, and everything else, but we haven't really ever thought about where he places. And I think one of the reasons is his raw strike rate is good, but it was before the days when we went back and realized how good it was considering the, uh, the part of the game he played mm -hmm. and everything else. And I just thought that he was a fantastic player who wasn't respected and we mm. just wanted to go back and have a look at him and, and, and point that out. Most of the other true greats of the IPL probably get a lot more respect than he does. Um, yeah. and it's, and a lot of it is just, it's as simple as if you bowl the middle overs, uh, sorry, if you bat in the middle overs, your strike rate isn't as high as everyone else's. Mm. And so you don't get remembered as that dude. Right. And, yeah. uh, and, but realistically from a game perspective, what he did is as as impressive as some of the real true megastars of the IPL. Yeah, you mentioned his uh, trademark inside-out shot over the covers. He managed that versus both pace and spin. Mm. And I mean, he, of course, dominated in the IPL. But even, you know, in an Indian shirt, he had a decently successful career. It was a good career. And, and he was a fine fielder as well. Uh, he bowled some part-time off-spin. And definitely, I don't think he's celebrated enough given those credentials, particularly in the IPL. Now, mm. his IPL record is one of the best in history, right? So much so that some consider him the greatest Indian batter to feature in the tournament. And if we look at batters with a minimum of 4,000 IPL runs, only Chris Gale, A.B. de Villiers and David Warner have a better true average and true strike rate than him. And that speaks volumes. Mm. And... What this basically means is that he was light years better than the average batter in the tournament and the only Indian batter to operate at that level. Yeah, and look, when T20 started, we we were still thinking about things very, very differently. The um, I always get it confused. Which one, which cap is which? Which one's the purple cap and which one's the orange cap? Orange cap is the batting one. Yeah, so the orange cap is for the most runs, right? And it's like... Mm -hmm. and. I've had these arguments with players directly, not, not IPL players, well, IPL players, but not in the IPL. Hmm. 
about them going, well, I'm going to score this many runs this year and I'll end up the leading run scorer. And I was like, yeah, but that doesn't mean anything. Um, <laughs> if you have a strike rate of 115, right? Like it's, yeah. it, you know, and, and the, from the minute the IPL did that and looked at it from purely a, you know, uh, a run scored, Rainer was always at a disadvantage, right? Because generally the leading run scorers in any tournament are going to be opening batters, maybe a number three occasionally but generally it's going to be the opening batter so the you've got coley and kl roll who both have six seasons no four seasons i think over 600 runs hmm. in, in, in the ipl and we talk about them all the time even even the negative stuff for kl he's always hmm. in the conversation whereas suresh Rainer had sub 600 um scoring seasons because he wasn't batting as high in, in those positions and he had a different role and so he's not looked at the same way and then you've just got the natural thing of the strike rate so mm -hmm. the other three players that you've talked about there you've got who was it gail de villiers and warner right yes those so are two openers and another guy who was through the middle a little bit like rainer but a little bit later and then was hitting sixes after sixes at the death Right. Yeah. And, and completely destroying things at the death. Rainer really sits in the middle of those two camps. Mm. And so he never got that respect. And he wasn't the, the, you know, as consistent a run scorer as some of the openers, just, not because he wasn't any good, just because that is how it works. Right. You don't get as many opportunities to, to be able to do that. And so it's, it's a very, very different uh, way of doing it. And I think if you look at probably the history of, of ODI cricket, we've probably done a similar thing there where we have a lot of players in ODI cricket who are great, but they're great in a role that is not as exciting as the openers mm. um, and everything else. And, you know, Rainer never had a single season scoring over 600 runs, right? Yeah. Like, it, it, and it's, it's as simple as the fact that it's almost impossible to do that from those other positions other than a few, you know, one or two fluke seasons. Mm. I mean, 88.5% of Raina's innings in the IPL came at first drop. Ironically, yeah. his jersey number was also three. And look, he could maximize the power play scoring briskly versus pace. And then his spin game in particular was enviable, which is what made him such a great middle overs batter. And that combo in itself, right, is uh, quite unique in the sense that it makes you a very valuable T20 batting asset because he did not have many limitations. He did, but in that phase of the game, he was king. Yeah, there's, um, we see this a lot with some of the Indian batters, the sort of, sort of more technically correct. They, mm -hmm. They're pretty good against pace in the power play. Yeah. Uh, you know, they can, they can score boundaries against it and keep it going. Then uh, they're usually brilliant against spin. The difference with him being brilliant against spin than others is his ability to continually hit it for boundaries. Hmm. which was a really, really special one. And the two things that he struggled with were the short ball. So he would probably struggle in this version of the IPL with the extra bouncer a little bit more. And the other hmm. thing he struggled with was when he got to the death of being able to clear the ropes. So yeah. against spin, he could hit boundaries quite easy um, towards the end, but he struggled a little bit more against um, the, the quicks at the end of his innings. It might have also been a fitness thing because most of the times he was probably batting there, he'd probably already been in for a while. So I don't know if it was a combination of both or, or, or just one thing, but that's, um, it, it, that is still not a negative compared to all the positives he does mm -hmm. because throughout the early part of T20 cricket especially, no one scored quicker against pace uh, against spin than pace. Like it just wasn't a thing that people did. Chris Gale, Cameron Akmal, Suresh Rainer are the guys who start to change that. And now look at the world that we're in, right? You know, where yeah. we have guys like uh, Patadar and Heinrich Klassen and guys who are le legitimately uh, spin destroyers mm. that are coming through. That is, we are now understanding understanding how important that was, and we didn't really factor it in as much. And with Gale. Because he could also hit pace, we we didn't think about that as much. Whereas with Rainer, because he wasn't as good against pace, it was like literally a, a spin player. And I and I think, well, I don't think I know this for a fact. You go through the history of Indian cricket, the players who can play play pace brilliantly are usually a Jinky Rahane aside, put up on a pedestal, right? Mm -hmm. And the players who are just great against spin are looked at as well. Anyone could be great against spin, right? 
And you you go through the old stories of Indian cricketers and, you know, them facing Fred Truman all the way through today. And it's always been a hangover of Indian cricket, right? Mm. And, and you compare that to Australia, right? Whereas in Australia, there are lots of players who can only play pace and aren't mm. particularly good at spin. And they don't get the same level of scrutiny. And, and it's I think it's about the courage factor, right? But actually, it's got nothing to do with courage, right? It's all about... Of course, Australian players are better against pace. And of course, Indian players are, are better against spin. It's about the conditions and what mm -hmm. you face. And so I think, again, there's a little bit of a holdback with Rayner compared to some of the other players because he probably didn't quite have that uh, level of game against the quicks as, as everyone else did. But he was probably... You can make an argument that he was probably the best scorer slash batter against spin. Maybe Raidu, who we talked about recently, was a <laughs> better technical player of spin than he was. But if you're combining strike rates and everything else, I think Reina is uh, on a completely different level. Yeah, and I mean, of course, uh, he wasn't a muscler of pace, right? He could find the gaps and play his mm. shots, which is why he was good versus pace in the power play. But his prowess versus spin was exceptional. And I suppose that also made him a perfect fit at Chennai, right? Because he got to play mm. all of his home games at Chipok. And that is a match made in cricket heaven, if there ever was one. No, exactly. I mean, that's the other thing of it's the it's kind of the Scotty Pippen debate, right? Or mm -hmm. the um, you know, you, or you get a footballer who plays a particular p uh, position, and they you, they use a formation that that kind of uses that, right? Of if you are used absolutely correctly, you are probably going to look even better than you are than if if he had played at if he played for RCB. What conversation will we be having about him now, right? He would be a very, very different kind of player if he played at RCB. His play of spin is probably even better than we think it is because he had to do it on the spinning wickets. And what he, and then eventually Raidu as well, allowed for is for them to just go, well, we're going to make the wickets absolutely ragged. So not only was he used brilliantly, um, you know, in conditions that, that suited him, he allowed for an entire game plan to be built up, right? Because if you don't have Reina, you you then probably can't have the pitches turning sideways, right? You can't yeah. you, you you can't do it without both. And if you want a cricket one, the one I remember is the um, that period where South Africa was spicing up their wickets and they were making them so that you had to take balls on the body. And Faf Du Plessis' plan was quite simply: we are not the most talented, we are not the best batting team, but we are the toughest batting team. And we can accept more balls on our body than anyone else does. So when they come to South Africa, they're going to get hit a lot and it's going to bother them. And we're going to get a hit a lot and we're just going to get on with it, right? Mm. You need the players to be able to do that plan. You can't just do that plan with like a random Bangladesh team from like 2008, right? Because they'd be mm. like, why are we getting hit by our own pitches? Yeah, <laughs> you know, and, and and you know, there are probably many great Australian sides where it's like uh, we can't have the pitch turning um, um, square because that will bring the opposition in more than it will bring us in. Whereas with Reina, it allowed them to do that, and then that you know you 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 then start to have that what Imran Tahir and Moeen Ali and Ravi Jadeja and Teek Shana, you know that whole generation after but also the whole generation before you know mitch santon has been there for a while you know the various finger spinners that they've had going through that that lineup is because that they are picking batters who are very good against spin at the same time it's a brilliant strategy and but you need probably one genius to be able to help you do it and that is him yeah they had both Rana and rayudu so <laughs> that must have been fun right but uh, if we break down his numbers versus different bowling types right now versus the quicks uh sorry shrina preferred Right arm pace over left. And like most southpaws, he loved himself some left arm finger spin and didn't play enough left arm wrist spinners. His record versus right arm leg spin, though, wasn't at the same level, but still above par with a true strike rate of more than 13. So that's still pretty decent. Mm. What do you think might be the reason behind this disparity between left arm finger spin and right arm leg spin, though? Because they're both turning the same way. Maybe, maybe is it googly's? It, it could be. It could be mm. that, you know, occasionally he wasn't picking the wrong ends. Um, mm. it, it's also, you know, and I think we've probably talked about this stuff before. You, I much prefer to face wrist spin than, than finger spin. It doesn't really matter to me if it's spinning in or spinning away. And I like to face wrist spin in part because it goes up and then comes down. Mm. And, and that's 
obviously something in my brain that works a little bit better and I can understand it. And I feel like I can use my feet more to it. Um, and I feel like I can sweep pretty much every ball from a wrist spinner. Right. So, so if a leg spinner bowls a ball on middle stump and it's spinning away, I could sweep it. If a left arm finger spinner pitches a ball on, on middle stump, I'm, I'm not as confident sweeping. Right. And I don't know what the difference is or whatever it is, but you look through players and quite often you see those sorts of patterns come through, mm. which is, it just works. And I don't know if it has something also to do with the, uh, he, he probably wanted to play throughout, through the offside, uh, when it, when he was playing against most bowling, because that was where he was at his absolute best. Um, and maybe the angle of a left arm mm. finger spinner allowed that more than a wrist spinner did. So if you think about wrist spin, uh, like leg spin to a left-hander before the day before now where they all bowl really, really wide on purpose. But in the old days they would pitch the ball around off stump and spin it back in. Uh, and that actually caused a little bit of issue. Whereas a left arm finger spinner, even if they are pitching the ball and off stump, the angle is still from so much wider that you can use the angle, whether they're coming from over the wicket or around the wicket, they're not coming from near the stumps. So you have the ability to play with that. So it could be that, or it could just be that he preferred to play finger spin than, than wrist spin, which is another common thing that we see from players um, all the way through. Uh, and then, and then, as you said, you've got the wrong and, um, aspect of it as well. I remember looking up Nicholas Puran. So Crick Info used to have, and they might still have it on their back end, I'm not sure, but they used to have this thing on their back end, which had leg spinners, and then it had leg spin who could bowl wrong and, right? Ooh. And I don't know why they entered it in the system this way, but if you look, I remember looking up Nicholas Puran and against people who were classified as leg spinners who didn't really have a wrong end, he was, he had a um, batting average of like 200 <laughs> and against leg spinners who had a wrong end, he had a batting average of 40. Okay. Right. And so, it, it, you know, that ability to just bowl that ball that occasionally goes the other way, uh, you know, and whether you pick it or not is not always the most important thing. It's just that it's going the other way. And now you are, it's like facing another off spinner, um, except with more dip on the ball. So it may, maybe it's something along those lines as well, uh, that causes a bit of an issue for some players. Yeah, fair enough. Now, if we look at Suresh Raina's entry points, he batted most frequently between overs four and 14, which is basically half a T20 innings, mostly in the middle overs phase. His record, obviously, we've spoken about this already, holds up at the end of the power play as well. Mm -hmm. And his true numbers show that he was a plus batter in every phase of an innings. Now, a quick scorer in the middle overs who could, in theory, bat anywhere. That is a very unique skill set, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, he could have been an opener or a number four, mm -hmm. right? Probably... Yeah. Once you get to five and six, maybe his lack of power might have cost you some um, uh, runs mm -hmm. at the other end. But there's nothing in his record that suggests he couldn't have opened the batting. Mm -hmm. if, he, if he'd faced a new ball, he would have got more bounces. But that's maybe not a bad thing for the team because if he's facing more bounces, it means they're softening up that ball a little bit quicker. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, the, his teammates might have also benefited from that and they you know they wouldn't have been trying swing or anything so yeah so i think that ability and and if you look at him he's probably like they used him at number three yeah. and i don't know how, how do you feel about t20 cricket i kind of feel that we still don't really know what kind of player should bat at number three in t20 cricket yeah yeah absolutely not i don't think we're even remotely close to that because a lot of teams who are not dynamic with their batting lineups completely fuck that up right yeah, yeah. And, and like so I'm trying to think, like, who are the best number threes in T20 cricket at the moment? Like, who, who are the who are the players that like automatically we 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 think of as stars who are number threes? Because it's uh, openers and number four and number five. You know that sort of Shim Dube, Glenn Maxwell hmm. kind of position um, right. are really really unique Mitch Marsh. And, and special. Mitch yeah, Marsh Mitch Marsh is, is probably one. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that was uh, that's quite recentish. Yes. If, if you know, I mean, all things considered, it, it's quite recent-ish. And so it's it's a weird position. And and I think of him more as a um, number four, even though he played at number three, because not not that, uh, uh, you know, not that he wasn't particularly good at, in that position. But what I mean is he bats more like a lot of conventional number fours, right? Yeah. But, but probably because he could score in the power play, <clears throat> And you wanted him in early, like you want him, you want to guarantee he's in from the seventh over. 
Yeah. It's much better for him to bat at number three. So I'm like, I'm just having a look here. And, and it does tell you the difference. Like if we were doing openers right now, you imagine who the list would be. This is last three years, the most runs. Riley Russo, Mitch Marsh, Colin Munro, Sanju Sampson, Tom Collar Cadmore, Shy Hope, Chris Lynn. And then you got Nicholas Puran, who's probably played everywhere. You got people mm. like Tripathi, Lorcan Tucker, mm. Dawid Milan, Sai Sadarshan. It's not <laughs> the A list, right? Yeah, it's not. And so, and so again, I think Chennai played an absolute blinder here by using him at three and not four, because I think most teams would have used him at four. Mm. Um, <clears throat> and uh, so they, again, that's, and, and that's a testament to how skillful he was, right? Because he wasn't just a guy who could play spin. Uh, and if he was completely one dimensional, you almost have to bat him at four. Whereas uh, in this position, you have to bat him at three. And I remember talking to Brad Hodge about batting at number four. And I've said this before in T20 cricket, it's probably the toughest position because you, you get respected the least because your strike rate's low. Hmm. You generally have to come in. If you're coming in in the power play, it means something's gone wrong. <laughs> uh, if you're coming in after the power play, you're facing the opposition's best spinner and the field is out. Like there's no easy job. Whereas batting at number three, you have the ability to cash in on the power play still. You might not be slogging in it, but you certainly can still cash in on it. And generally when you, when you start facing the spinners, you, you faced five or six balls at least. Yeah. And I mean, if you look at Ryan's record between overs seven to 11 and that's a phase where most batters tend to slow down. He did amazingly well. Another super cool Suresh Raina stat uh, in the IPL is that his bat batting records in the first and second innings of a game are fairly similar, uh, mm. with his true average slightly higher in chases. Yet, we don't think of him as this elite chaser or anything like we do, say, Virat Kohli or MS Dhoni. And it's quite crazy how... His his form doesn't particularly fluctuate between innings. Yeah, do you know, I think that's probably more common. It's just because we've had players like, you know, Dhoni and, and mm. Carol Rowell who are so much better chasing that we think, not Carol Rowell, Virat yeah, Kohli, sorry, um, who are so much better chasing that we kind of in our minds think that this is more common. And I don't mm. think it is as common as we think it is. I, I do think there are players who prefer the first innings to the second innings. And I, I think there are other, you know, technical reasons in some cases mm. and mental reasons and all those sorts of things. But isn't it more, isn't it better for your team if someone is just as good in the first innings as mm. they are in the second innings, being that you're going to do that about 50% of the time anyway? Like we sort of <laughs> get infatuated with the great chases. And it's like, yeah, I get it. It's a great skill to have. If but if you're not winning games in the first innings, uh, you, you're probably still around a 50-50 player. So you want someone who's really good in both innings. And, you know, that's a thing with Suresh Reina. But again, to go back to reasons why he doesn't stand out, it's easier to stand out if you're an outlier, right? So if he yeah. was the world's best ever first innings player, we might have noticed that. And it, <laughs> obviously, if he would have been a great chaser, we might have noticed that. But it, it, because he was pretty much the same in both it, it doesn't he doesn't get the credit he deserves for actually being really handy whether you win the toss or lose the toss yeah it, it is phenomenal and uh, if you look at his IPL record Suresh Rainas, it's better than that of MS Dhoni but Dhoni finished games and was obviously India and Chennai's skipper supreme as well whereas mm. Raina of course wasn't as good for India and batted higher up but based on everything that we've spoken of just now would you say this is a number three thing? Do you think this is the role that is causing him to kind of uh, go, you know, under Dhoni's shadow? Yeah, I mean, just going back to that list we talked about before, mm -hmm. like there aren't many, even to this day, number three stars, right? Yeah. And if Ricky Ponting played T20 cricket, he would probably be an opener now. Mm -hmm. uh, Brian Lara would probably be an opener. I'm not sure there are many players who were, you know, great first drop and second drops in in one day cricket who wouldn't would either be batting at four or opening they wouldn't bat at three it's a, a very different position and then you are caught between he doesn't get the orange caps and he doesn't get as many wins right so on one side you've got Virat Kohli with a bunch of orange caps and on the other side you have MS Dhoni with a bunch of wins at at the end mm -hmm. of games that is what they are both known for add on to that as you just said the fact that they are both also Indian stars yeah. Not Indian players, but Indian mm. stars. And I think it's fair to say that Suresh Arena probably never quite made that level, um, yeah. at, at, you know, as a cricketer. And because of that, again, there's another thing that sort of 
drag him down is the wrong way of putting it, but you know what I mean? Holding him back, I suppose, um, from that. And so if you look at the amount of not outs that they had in, in chases, in successful chases, I think Suresh Rain is not far behind Dhoni um, in numbers. Is it five or six behind him? And yet we, when we are thinking about that, we're also adding in all the times we saw Dhoni do that for India. Right? Yeah, of course. And so it's very, very, and then, uh, you know, it's, so it's very, very different, but purely as an IPL batter, if those are the two guys that are second and third on the list or, or in the top three with him, I should say, you can make a really easy case that Suresh Reina is the best um, Indian IPL batter um, based on just the what he did. Emotionally, it's very different. I think emotionally, it probably would go back towards um, Virat and uh, and um, Dhoni, right? Mm. But if you're talking about game on game impact, well, Suresh Reina, I think, has both of them covered with the bat. If you make any content, Minbo Pro is the tool for you. Take your long format content and cut it and slice it for social media. This AI inspired weapon will turn your one piece of work into so many clips. Try Minbo.pro now. Yeah. And I mean, I remember you did that piece on strike rate progression not too long ago. And I remember Ryan's graph in that, yeah. right? It's very different to what we see from anchor batters because the strike rate was significantly above average throughout, right? Not just a little, it was quite above the average. And that's what made him so special in the middle overs. But then mm. that dip towards the end, you alluded to this earlier that perhaps that's because the quicks are back on and the fielders are spread out this time, or it could be a fitness thing as well. But just that strike rate pro progression graph, have you ever seen any other batter with that? <laughs> no, I can't think. I mean... I can't think of another player mm. that would have that kind of graph, even like mentally. Mm. Trying to think if there would be, no, because the Pakistani guys would be too slow. Yep. Yeah, I can't think of anyone else who is like that. And look, Rainer was a weird athlete, right? Um, yeah. He was athletic, but he wasn't always fit athletic, if that makes sense. You know, we, there's a, when we did our best fielders for Creek Peaks, a lot of people upset that Rainer wasn't on the list. And I was yeah. like, look, he had some good fielding skills. If you think he was in the best 15 fielders of all time, you are high. Because yeah. um, he I absolutely is nowhere near the best fielders of all time. Mm. But but he had some athleticism, but he also was, didn't always look, you know, in prime physical shape. But on top of that, I think he was a timer of the ball. Mm. And timers of the ball towards the end of t20 games can have trouble sometimes because the when the ball gets a little bit soft you want to be tim david or romario shepherd or you know uh kyron pollard or, or andre russell someone who can muscle the ball over right why is why is sun on Ryan better early on than he is later the ball is harder and he can um, swing through the line and know that he's going to clear that the rope uh, the, the circle really easily at the end, he struggles a little bit more to have that kind of impact because he keeps hitting the ball to long off and long on over and over again, right? And and I think Rainer was probably a little bit like that. And I don't know if it wasn't. I, as I said, I don't think he was ever the fittest player. Um, mm. And he did play quite long innings. And I wonder if that was an issue as well. But I, it, for me, it's probably more he couldn't muscle the seamers over the top. And mm. if, if you think about... And, very different kinds of, of athletes and players. But if you think about someone like Jadeja, that was Jadeja's big problem. Do you remember he'd come in in test matches and he'd whack the ball everywhere and then he'd play in one days or T20s and he had this really crazy low strike rate. Yeah. And then he worked on the ability to hit sixes. I don't think Rainer probably ever worked on that. And, uh, and you know, and, and oh, sorry, I should say, if he did work on it, it never worked the way that mm. it did for Jadeja to get to that level. I think if Rainer plays now, this would be less of an issue because yeah. he would have grown up in the range hitting era a lot more mm. and in the core strength era a lot more. And there's no reason why he wouldn't be able to do it now. But I think in his era, that wasn't really, it wasn't even what he was in the side for, right? Like he was yeah. literally in the side to bat from overs four to 14. Um, and then, and then let the, and then let Tony come in and do the job at the end. And if we look at, uh, you know, his IPL seasons between 2008 and 2014, Ryan crossed the 400 run mark in every single one of those seasons. And he even crossed 500 runs thrice in those seven yeah. years. 
Now, when we talk about batting peaks in the Indian Premier League, uh, that has got to be right up there, right? Yeah, it's ridiculous. And, and I think, so he never averages, I just want to get this right, looking at it now. Yeah, he never averages 50 in a year in that period. So he averages, I think his lowest average was 26 in 2012. He, he got past it in 2012 because he played 19 matches. But, um, but, but he averages 26 in, in, in that year. But every other year, it's 38, 31, 47, 32, 42, you know, so really, really uh, 40 as well. Um, you know, really, really strong averages in all those years. But it's the strike rates that I think are most impressive. Mm-hmm. So 2008, he comes in in the middle overs and his strike rate is 142. Then it's 140, yeah. 142, 134, 135, 150, 146. If you go back and look at number fours and or number threes and number fours in the IPL in that period, I don't think you're finding anyone else with that mm. kind of number, right? Like I, it's, it's just, it's not something that was happening in, well, it wasn't something that was happening in T20 cricket. Like the reason Maxwell gets paid so much money is largely um, is largely from uh, the fact that uh, he was uh, what able to score in that middle period in a way that no one else ever had, right? You know that mm. you know that ability to be able to do to to come in and maximise that, and he obviously played against uh, the spinners in a much more what what would you say extravagant way? In a, you know in 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 a, in a far more um, noteworthy way right like of hitting sixes and going absolutely nuts and and you know we all we all noticed him whereas you know the way that Suresh Rainer played it was probably more traditional spin batting I, I think would, would be the way that you would look at that and so because of that again he didn't quite get the attention but my guess is if you looked at other players so I'll just I just want to have a look at this and see how close I am so these are all the players who batted at number three and number four from uh, in the IPL up until 2015. So he's got a thousand more runs than the next person in that position, right? Wow. Which that tells you a lot. His strike rate is 141. Rohit's strike rate in that period was 127. Virat Kohli was 124. De Villiers was 133. Okay. Sangakara, 123. Dinesh Kartik, 124. You have to go down to Shane Watson. Who didn't mm. who didn't bat there all that much, but he was a fantastic. He was probably the, one of the first great number threes when we should have come up with him before. Uh, mm-hmm. He had a strike rate of one four nine. You know, Utapa one three one, Dhoni one three seven, Sean Marsh one three five, and then you got Yusuf Patan at one five seven. Right, so no one managed to actually score at that level other than Yusuf Patan, who just came in and whacked it, and Shane uh, Watson, who was basically a backup power play batter right and and would do really really well and they didn't make anywhere near the amount of runs he did yet i don't remember anyone talking about suresh Raina being you know in the top three quickest kinds of players and it's because the overall strike rate of 140 while being really really impressive there were going to be other guys who were striking at 145 150 155 because they were batting at the death or in the power play and so Again, it just comes back to that basic thing. You're, you're, you're stuck in the middle of that. And we now understand, you know, I think Glenn Maxwell really has allowed us to think about these things massively differently, right? Mm-hmm. I really do think that Glenn Maxwell allowed us to think about that. And, you know, I remember having conversations with cricket teams, even in 2017, 2018. And at this stage, Rain is on his, on his deathbed, on his career. <laughs> I'm talking to teams and just going, you want to know how to get better? Pick guys who are really good against spin and allow them to score at a rate of 130, 140 against spin in that period. Your team, you, you, you will win so many tournaments being able to do that. And teams just couldn't get their head around it. Um, and um, I remember having a conversation with Dan Christian, and I can't remember who he was playing for, but he sent me a message one day when he went up the order because he finally convinced someone to allow him to go up the order and whack the spinners. And he was so excited by it. Um, and 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 you know so that's how backwards that was and so that's how backwards the thinking was and so we weren't actually noticing that Suresh Rainer was doing exactly what we thought he should be doing yeah and i mean you mentioned how glenn maxwell has paid crazy money right and suresh rainer on the other hand if you look at him he never made crazy money as such at chennai which is surprising given his record but maybe it's because we looked at cricket differently just as you alluded like he had one year of 12.5 crores whereas shikhar has had four, right? 
Yeah. And, and we should it, say those numbers are a bit shaky for two reasons. Yeah. One, not all the early um, seasons were 100% sure what people were getting paid. Mm. Some of it is based on assumptions, although I think those numbers are pretty accurate. And the other one is players are often paid under the table as well. But mm. you're, what you just said is still also right. Shikadawan certainly got a bunch of big paydays for never being anywhere near the level of player that Suresh Reina did. Yeah. And I mean, maybe if he was a player in this era, he would have been, you know, one of the better played, paid players because that I, skill set is, is crazy. I, th I think the two things that get underpaid almost always are uh, defensive seamers mm -hmm. and middle order batters. And if I'm running a franchise, I reckon I can, I can get myself pr two pretty good middle order batters um, without busting my bank uh, and then get pretty two standard openers in front of them. And then you can probably get some cheaper, you know, Sandeep, if you think the IPL, Sandeep mm -hmm. Sharma, um, you know, type, um, Seamers, uh, you know, Natarajan, those sorts of guys. So I think even now he would, he probably wouldn't still be at the level that he should be at, but you are right. We now understand a lot more about that. And, you know, look at the hype over Clarkson and Patadar, you know, in this yeah. particular tournament and understanding what that means. And look at that compared to Guy Quad and Sai Sadarshan and Shubman Gill, who are all fantastic players, but they, play the game normally whereas Patadar can completely change the game in that middle period and that is what Rainer was doing it's yeah. just that it was from a lower base right so instead mm. of having a strike rate of 200 against spin he was having a strike rate of 140 but in in Patadar's era a lot of people have a strike rate of 140 against spin whereas yeah. in Rainer's era a lot of people had a strike rate of 100 against spin Hmm. Right, like so, the jump up is still absolutely massive. So you're yeah. right. I think if he played now, he would be more respected and would be paid a lot more. But I still think I'm trying to think who, who's. A, I still think if it's him, uh, uh, oh, actually, if it's him and Shubman Gill, hmm. actually that's a bad one because Shubman Gill had one great season, didn't he? Um, I'm not sure how much more money Reina would get right now than Ishan Kishan, right? Whereas I think. There's no comparison between them, as, uh, uh, you know, their, their mm. impact on IPL season. Ishan Kishan is a slightly plus player probably all the way through his career um, mm. and has been paid like a star at times, right? Yeah. And Suresh Reina was a star for decades, <laughs> a decade in, in the IPL and was barely ever paid like one. And I think th that is, and, and we certainly didn't get the respect of, of that, mm. um, that, that, that he, he should have. Yeah, coming back to Rana's numbers in the IPL, let's look at his true values, right? And in his peak years, 2008 to 2014, he had several seasons with a true strike rate of 10 or more and his overall numbers were close to those of AB and Warner. In total, he had a negative true average in just five seasons and there were three seasons in which both his true average and true strike rate was below zero. Yeah. Not negative by an awful lot, though, barring 2021. And basically, that allows us to conclude that he was a net positive batter even outside of his peak years, which I think strengthens his case of being yeah. the best Indian batter to grace the IPL. Yeah, I don't think, if you compare him to Kohli and um, pro probably Kohli, but Donny might be there as well. Uh, although Donny's had a weird drop off, but he's a little bit older. Mm -hmm. But I think he probably had a bigger um, peak than those guys, but did drop off a little bit quicker than than the other guys. I mean, how old is Suresh Reina right now? 37. Right? And so, what, his last season was 2021? Does that sound right? Yeah. That's, cool. That's a normal athletic curve, but... Hmm. We are now getting a B to Vs and MS Donies and Faf Duplessis batting on longer, right? And so, mm -hmm. so and again, that might go back to conditioning and how much you get out of your body, or it could just be, be his reflexes and his eyes started to go. But because of the kind of player he was, my guess is that when he wasn't at his peak, he was probably still in the top four or five players of spin, mm. right? Like... And that is a very, that is a thing that allows you just to stick around a little bit longer. You know, why does Brad Hodge keep playing until he's, um, uh, he's 48, right? It's because 
yeah, a lot of Brad Hodge's actual batting. I don't know if he was that old, but it felt like he was that old. <laughs> Sorry, Hodge. Um, but the, the the things that Hodge did really, really well, which was control the tempo of a T Twenty game, um, uh, you know, and get and make sure that your your top order always reaches your hitters, right? Mm -hmm. That didn't go away from Hodge. Peak Brad Hodge, right? Could do lots of different things for your team, right? But that if you keep that one elite skill, you're still really handy. And I think that Suresh mm -hmm. Rainer did that. And I, I don't know, I, I don't know why he had the drop off at the end. Uh, you know, it, it could have just been, you know, one he's one of those athletes where that happened. He might not have kept, con mm -hmm. you know, a, as good control over his body, or you know, didn't you know, dietary or fitness or whatever that may be. Or it could have just been one of those things where the eyes or the knees started to go, and that was it. Or his back started to go, you know, normal batting uh, thing. But he could have the reason he kept playing at a high level even after his peak was because he still had those other skills so even as he got older i always thought he got a lot worse against the short ball right mm. so i don't know from the age of 30 31 maybe i was like there was a couple of times where he was playing and i was like oh my god he's gonna get killed here he really <laughs> looks like he's not picking this up well at all right but he was still so good in that other job that you you still keep him in. So he's a plus player, even if he's not a massive plus player in the way that uh, he was earlier in his career. Um, but he doesn't have that long tail that some of these other players yeah. have, which again, you know, for legacy, we, and, and that's what we're really talking about here. For legacy, that's where those things matter. Yeah. I mean, if we just look at his career for India for a bit, right? You talked about him not going on as long as those other guys, your your Fafs and your Dhonis. And... I mean, he did have the talent, but something did drop off. Maybe it was the reflexes, maybe it was the eyesight, maybe it was the fitness. But he hadn't even turned 32 yet. It was yeah. July 2018 and he had already played his final game for India as a 31-year-old, where a lot of batters are also peaking, maybe in this generation more so. Uh, so, I mean, it is a bit tragic, isn't it? That at least in T20s, you would have thought that Raina could have gone on a bit longer, but that India career always... It was left like yearning for a bit more that no one ever got. Yeah, I remember I was in Sri Lanka when he made that hundred um, in the Test match, and my dad was there. And I his think, debut game, right? Was yeah, I think it was his debut, wasn't it? Yeah. Mm. And I remember my dad watching him, just going, "This guy's gonna be incredible," and it, and it never quite happened, right? Like, mm. he, you know, in Test cricket was probably the the. It wasn't even maybe the short ball. It was India's fear of him and the short mm. ball that caused them some problems. And in one day cricket, he was good, but never quite got to that level um, that he that he needed to. And I suppose from 2015 onwards, if you think about one day cricket, bounce has become a much bigger part of the game at that mm. point. Um, and so maybe, you know, again, that limits his ability to be able to play, certainly back of a length bowling. True. But he, he doesn't quite become that great right and it's not that he didn't play incredible innings and that he wasn't certainly a plus player but he doesn't quite get to that level and we are now or oh, i'm trying to think raidu is another one reina um well reina paid more than raidu but no no, no but also... boovy boovy is another yeah. one where we have players who have been great in the ipl mm. but not great for india yeah right now that's always been the case. Domestic cricket has always had these kinds of cricketers before. The difference is before that you didn't know who the hell they were because you never saw any of them anyway, and they were just names on a scorecard. So yeah. now we have this thing of, and you know, we've seen it in Big Bash and the Blast, and you know, CPL and all these different leagues around the world. Well, we have these players who absolutely dominate in their league, and but they don't quite back it up with the international performance. And so they're kind of like left in the limbo a little bit, right? Like of like Boovy might be the best new ball bowler the IPL's ever had, hmm. right? Like peak Boovy was absolutely incredible, and he was a brilliant death bowler for a long period of time as well. But Boovy's international career, it's fine, but yeah. no one would say he was an Indian. You know, it was kind of when he moved out of the team is when the fast bowling got really good for India, right? Yeah. And and yet he's out. A lot of those guys who were brilliant for India. He's completely up them in the IPL. Hmm. And Rainer is probably in that same situation. So their fan base probably think of them as an all-time great. And hardcore IPL people might think of them as an all-time great. But because of the lack of international success or, you know, consistent success or being a star hmm. at the international level, uh, they're kind of left kind of at this other, other area. And, you know, in the future, in 50 years' time, will that matter as much, right? Hmm. 
if the IPL is the most dominant form of cricket, we'll look back and go, oh, Rainer was a great, and everyone will, you know, why why did we not talk about this great player more? <laughs> I, I, so all those things are very, very possible. But yeah, it does mean that he's kind of left in this no man's land. Hmm. I mean, in Rainer's defense, uh, the 2014 and 2016 T20 World Cups where India were like a superb team. Right, he was slated into bat at numbers four and five. Now, surely that is not optimal utilization of his skill set, and it might be fair to say that India missed a big trick there. Yeah, I think looking back on it, this is, this is I don't, I would not say that what they did was a mistake because, as I was saying before, I think of him as a number four, even though he batted at mm. number three, and he profiles much more like a number four player than he does a number three, and. Mm. You know, he wouldn't be the only player to be really good in domestic cricket and play one position lower at the international level because you're fitting in other stars, right? And it's always easy to find guys for the, the top positions. It's harder to find them for the middle. But looking back and doing the stats, yeah, they missed out. He, he certainly mm -hmm. should have been batting at number three, and that was probably an error from them. Yeah. Now, let's talk a bit about Ryan, the part-time offie as well. His true economy was better against right-handed batters and was in the positive against both righties and lefties. Now, his true wickets uh, per four overs were better against left-handers, and that makes complete sense for a right-arm off-spinner, right? But also, that makes him a pretty good value part-time option, doesn't it? Yeah, I, I mean, his bowling was weird, right? It was, it was jaunty. Um, there was something about it that you kind of felt like it could go horribly wrong. Um, but he was a smart bowler and I think he put the ball in the right area without always being the most skillful, but yeah, it's not like Dhoni's wicket keeping, right. Or, or Rohit's captaincy. It's not yeah. that level of a second skill. But again, if you, you look now, who's the best part-time Indian, um, bowler, um, in the last 10 years? Well, Indian makes it harder, right? It's the I'm, Indian. I said yeah. Indian on purpose. Yeah. Right? Um, so they had Sehwag, now, Then yeah. they had Raina. Hmm. Yuvraj then, towards the end was kind of part time. But oh, Yuvraj. No, yeah. So Yuvraj hmm. would have been another one. So there's three. Hmm. So they up and, but, but, you know, the generations before there was one. The generation during his career, there was another one. Raina's kind of the last part time uh, that, that India had any access to. Yeah. And you look at these young kids coming up now. Who are the young Indian batting talents who can give you proper bowling? Not Abhishek Sharma, even though they do bowl him every now and then. Yeah, I mean, he's very much an infrequent. Jaiswal obviously yeah. can bowl and over occasionally. Riyam <laughs> Parag, very occasionally. Hmm. Indian, in, top Indian batters do not ha provide any bowling anymore. Right? That's true. And, and the reasons are obvious. It's because, you know... Uh, I think the Indian team has four guys who travel with them uh, doing throwdowns, right? Um, uh, you know, uh, Raul Dravid told me a story about how in the nets he used to face Sachin Tendulkar bowling medium pace to him because hmm. um, they didn't have enough net bowlers. There's a big <laughs> difference between that, <laughs> yeah, right, and, and and where we are now. And, you know, there are net bowlers everywhere and kids are keen to, be, you know, get a chance. Even overseas players become net mm. bowlers, right? Like it, it's a completely different world. And... Because of that, specifically in India, but I think it will happen everywhere eventually, we don't have many batters who bowl part-time options anymore. So I get, and we, because Rainer came on the back of Yuvraj Singh and, and Vrinda Sehwag and Sachin Tendulkar and, you know, other guys who could bowl a little bit, we didn't really rate it all that highly because it was just a thing that people did back in those days. You know, Michael Clark, you know, Ricky Ponting when he was young would bowl, right? Like, um, you know, we had lots of guys back the, in, in those days who, who would bowl a little bit. But looking at it, Reina might be kind of the last of the the proper top order players um, from India who could give them an option. And, you know, they might produce an actual all-rounder, you know, type player in the future, yeah. which is, a, we're not really talking about that. What we're talking about is a guy who on a, any given day can get a ball because he's, there's a bunch of left-handers or the wicket's spinning. And again, to go back to Chennai, that was a huge advantage to be able to have that. He was, he was never a great bowler, but he could bowl. And th that is that flexibility really does help. That you know, if you're one of your bowlers is struggling and you can get one over out of a part timer, that means you have flexibility throughout the rest of the innings. Yeah, and I mean, add Rana's fielding to the mix as well, and yep. you get a good mix of all three dimensions 
But he couldn't translate that IPL success in an Indian shirt. Not quite at that level, not even close. He was good for India. He is nowhere near being a great. And, I mean, why? <laughs> How? Look, I do think a big part of it is probably the faster balls being able to bowl, uh, target him more mm. with the short pitch bowling. Um, you know, if, it, if you look at the difference between one day um, short pitch bowling and T20 short pitch mm. bowling, for, um, essentially in T20, you can just swing away at it, mm. right? And so I remember it was late in his career. I remember him watching uh, watching Reina get bombed by someone and he just, he clearly wasn't up to it, but he was just swinging wildly at it and he got an edge over the keeper's head for six. And then he hit a decent pull shot, but a, a little bit of a top edge went over a fine leg for six. And the team had to stop bowling it to him, right? Because if you're in a one day, you're just like, if that's how you're going to play it, we'll just keep going because we're going to get you out in the next 10 or 15 runs. Mm. You're not going to be able to keep pulling this off. Right. And that's why one day cricket changed so much, you know, especially by the 2019 World Cup. It was a completely different sport because mm. people were just going more mid off and mid on up four four fielders out square leg, um, deep point, third and fine leg. And if you want to muscle back past mid off and mid on, we think you'll get you out. And if you're going to keep pulling and hooking, we think we're a big chance of getting you out. So I do think that that was probably a part of it. The ability to bowl more consistently back of a length to him and he couldn't just hit his way out of it. Uh, but also, I think it goes back to what you were saying before in T20 cricket, which is he probably, the role that he was best suited at, which Chennai built around him, didn't quite exist for the India team because they had so many other players who were similarly skilled. They might not have been as skilled as him, but similarly skilled. And so he probably ends up batting further and further down the order, which we all think is the right thing at the time. Hmm. And looking back on it, probably should have batted higher. Yeah, hindsight is twenty twenty. The sport is also twenty twenty. It's all everything's <laughs> twenty twenty. <laughs> yeah, but uh, I suppose at the end of this podcast, what we can safely conclude is that in terms of run scoring and strike rate in the IPL, uh, Suresh Raina was ahead of his time and was an integral cog in CSK's title winning campaigns. And uh, I guess the million dollar question remains, Jared: Is Suresh Raina the greatest Indian batter in the history of the IPL? I would say he is, um, but uh, obviously I'm much more an efficiency monster than a lot of people will be. I think a lot of people will go, wait a minute, he never even scored 600 runs in a season. And um, <laughs> I think he, I, I think considering the kinds of pitches he batted on and that were designed to be favorable to a particular bowling style, and yet he still managed to be absolutely brilliant on those wickets, I think kind of shows you what level he is at. I don't want to downplay uh, MS Dhoni or Virat Kohli or Carol Raul, or, you know, and, and there'll be, you know, Jaiswal might be up there eventually. I, th I think they're, you know, they play very, di very, very different roles. But I think knowing everything that I know about T20 cricket, I find it hard to say that Suresh Reina wasn't the most impactful of all of those batters, specifically in the IPL. Um, and, you know, that's all testament to him because they are also fantastic players. I think you could make an argument, a pretty valid argument for all three of the players mm -hmm. I just mentioned um, to be number one, right? Yeah. But I think I would feel most confident with my argument for Suresh Reina over the argument for the other two guys. Yeah, well, I'm sold as well, definitely, uh, especially after looking at those numbers and everything and the... You know, um, novelty of the number three batting role and how good he was for Chennai and all of those things combined. And uh, to all our viewers and listeners, you guys let us know in the comment section below as well whether you think that Suresh Raina is uh, the best ever Indian batter in the IPL or not. And uh, that also concludes this podcast. So if you enjoyed it, do give us a like on YouTube and subscribe to both this channel and Jared's other channel on YouTube. Quick reminder that you guys can go to goodareas.co and bookmark that webpage because it can serve as your one-stop shop to all of our written work, podcasts, and videos. We'll be back with another episode of Footmarks next week. That is all for now. Goodbye.